entrepreneurship, business, anything that you think about is really just a matter of systems. I overcomplicated the game so long because I thought that it was this illusional thing. Like I didn't know how. Mental health is the number one reason that entrepreneurs fail in business and nobody's talking about it. So today I'm bringing on a guy that knows this better than anybody that I've ever met, George Bryant, to break down how to get outside of your head and how to get into action so that you can start to build the business and the life of your dreams. Now, when you talk about credibility and somebody that knows what they're talking about based on experience and practice, not theory, George's story is like nothing you've ever heard of before. From somebody that went from being physically, sexually, and emotionally abused as a kid to going into the military, being in multiple deployments, then becoming one of the number one food bloggers and 22 time best selling authors on the New York Times list, to then after getting millions of followers across social media platforms and making millions of dollars, he completely gave up his entire business because of mental health. He was unfulfilled and got rid of all of it, which led to him attempting to take his own life multiple times. He has since then become the number one customer journey coach in the entire world, working with some of the biggest entrepreneurs, creating $3 billion businesses and over eight nine figure businesses with his incredible strategies and is now one of the happiest people you will ever meet. And he works with so many of the most elite entrepreneurs in the world on this exact topic, mental health. Now, before we get started, I just want to mention, I will link all of George's incredible content below. His podcast is something that will change your life like it has with mine. So you want to make sure after this interview, you go check out some of his social media platforms and his podcast. So without further ado, let's bring on George, talk about mental health and how you can get outside of your own head and back on the battlefield. All right, guys, welcome back to an episode that genuinely I believe is going to change your life. And I've got on a very good friend of mine, a dear brother, and also my business coach and business partner, George Bryant, who has one of, if not the most incredible stories that I've ever heard about, you know, where he's gone, where he started from and what he now does. But one of the most common themes that both of us consistently see is that mental health is the bane of most entrepreneurs existence and especially right now with where things are going in the economy in the world and all industries this is the number one thing that people need to be very cognizant of and be very aware of, of how to handle it throughout the growth of their business and so I'm really excited about this because George, you know, you and I have been on many conversations together and, and we'll get you to share your incredible story. But, you know, whenever we poll, you know, entrepreneurs or realtors or anybody, the number one thing they say they struggle with is not the tools, the strategies or the tactics, it's mental health, it's execution, it's discipline, it's belief and getting them outside of their own head. So dude, really excited to have you on here today and uh, just excited yeah. to, to bring this to, to people. I wanna open one loop about what you just said because you nailed it. A lot of people come to us knowing it's not the strategies and tactics, it's the discipline, the mindset, the beliefs, but also a lot of people listening to this also might be in the bucket of thinking it's the strategies and tactics, which mm -hmm. those tones will still need to be uncovered for you to find the evidence to realize that it is the beliefs and the disciplines. So it is, it is both. One is just a level above the other one, um, but solving at that level, just for people listening, just so you know, it can be either or. Uh, and we'll talk into that more later when it comes to changing. But I wanted to open that loop now so everyone has a reason to listen, Mike. Definitely. No, that it makes complete sense. And, and again, uh, I'm glad that you touched on that. So just to give some context and to, to kind of frame the conversation, I'd love for you to just share your story because you've started, you know, from a place that most people could never imagine, but now you've also gotten to a place on the positive side that most really want to get to. So yeah. why don't you unpack that for a few minutes and then we could start diving into some of the, the you know, more applicable aspects of this. And by a few minutes, Mike means five because if not, it would be 555 for chapter one. <laughs> I think to answer that and to tell that story, I wanna frame it correctly. And so I think one of the most important things to recognize the difference between where I was growing up in trauma with physical abuse, drug abuse, sexual abuse, and then active duty Marine Corps for 13 years with you know, more trauma, death, suicide, injuries, to now being the happiest most grounded and most successful I've ever been. I want to say this now, the feelings in my body are the same. I am the same person. I just view it very differently. And now it is something that creates massive amount of success for me. And so I want to say that to everybody now to frame 
the whole story because I wish somebody told me that 20 years ago when I started doing psychology work on myself and personal development work because that would have helped me understand that there was no finish line. There was just a different way of thinking and relating to my situations, which if I saw that earlier would have made me realize how much progress I'd already made and probably kept me in momentum a lot longer. And so I think that that's a really, really important place because I operated in most of my life under the belief that I was going to remove things forever, that I was going to get rid of things forever. The stressors were going to go away forever. The the pressure was going to go away forever. The feelings would go away forever. The anger would go away forever. And oh boy, oh boy, was that a game that you cannot win, right? And so <clears throat> I grew up, I would consider fortunate compared to some people's lives and unfortunate compared to other people's lives. But trauma is relative. And in my world, uh, the world that I chose to come into had a lot of physical abuse, drug abuse, more so neglect, mental abuse more than anything. And I was basically fending for my own, you know, my earliest memory. Um, lots of trauma, lots of memories, which then <clears throat> went into sexual abuse from people outside of my family, which caused very, very deep wounds, which led to eating disorder. And I ended up being bulimic, uh, even through most of my entire Marine Corps active duty career. And so imagine a dude who's one of the best crossfitters in the world with an eight pack 185 pounds in combat and then purging in porta potties because of stress and feeling out of control so it was a it was a dark cycle and in that career in the military um i i didn't speak to my maternal mother for 15 years due to the trauma in my childhood and my father and i really kind of rekindled our relationship but not as father son more as like acquaintances and mutual respect and then he ended up <clears throat> dying of cancer and i became his caregiver for the last six months of his life and you want to talk about full circle <clears throat> that one you know broke me pretty bad and i had uh, attempted my life before then and that was the moment where i realized that like i didn't want to die i just didn't know how to live and i was like i'm gonna be better and i didn't know what that looked like i didn't know what that meant and I just started brick by brick <clears throat> changing my relationship with myself. I wanted to eat clean. I didn't want to abuse my body anymore. And I started documenting the process and kind of accidentally became a food blogger. <laughs> and so that one thing led to another. And the Marine Corps was like, hey, we're medically separating you. Thanks for your service <clears throat> after 13 years to nothing. And I had no retirement plans except hand out smiley face stickers at Walmart. Like that was it. And I'm not joking. That is not a joke from where I came from getting into the Marine Corps and building a career and having the success that I had because I made E6 and I mean, I made E5 in like three years. I made E6 shortly after, like I was on a fast track awards, everything I'd made it like I'd, I'd made everything I'd ever wanted to do. And I was going to do my 20 to 30 years, collect my pension, make $3,200 for the rest of my life and go find some hobby or passion. And that was all taken away and I didn't have anything to go back on. And so all I had was that healing journey I'd started. And so it kind of became my new life. And fast forward, you can Google that one. Uh, you know, 22 week New York Times bestseller, number one app in the world. Uh, first digital product made a million dollars, had millions of followers, five to 10 million people a month on my website. Recipes repinned seven billion times and flown me up to Pinterest for it. Like the craziest things that you could ever imagine. And then I realized I hated cooking and that business was killing me because I had used it to neglect the number one most important thing, which is what we're talking about today, which was my relationship with myself. And so on 24 hours notice, I gave away a seven figure company. I deleted every social media follower I had. I changed my phone number, changed my email and disappeared and started really working on myself for the right reasons. My wife was um, <clears throat> eight months pregnant. We were about three weeks away from bankruptcy when I gave away that company. And the real work started then. I became a father <clears throat> and there was nowhere else to hide. And so then I just went behind the scenes and started helping people do in their businesses what I was doing in mine, which I didn't realize was groundbreaking or <laughs> anything that it was. It was just how I treated people, right? And then figured out ways to do it at scale. And then everything I touched had the Midas touch. And every single company I touched doubled, tripled, skyrocketed 10x. And then I was the new hot girl in high school and I was using what I taught myself to teach people and Trojan horse them into loving their customers and caring about them without me realizing they were doing it. <laughs> and then I would show them how caring made a difference and reminded them why they started in the first place. And so that 
led me down the road and that continued. And then uh, about three years ago, my wife was like, hey, listen, uh, I can't handle you talking anymore. It's time to go back on the internet. And so I was like, all right. And so in, right during COVID, March of 2020, we lost everything again. Uh, I lost like a half a million dollars a month in a matter of like 60 days and I had to restart and I'd known the game and I'd done the work on myself and I was in one of the hardest situations I've ever been in, like $100,000 a month in overhead with no money coming in. The feeling in my body hurt a thousand times worse than the feeling that hurt the first time I got my tax bill, but I knew it was coming and I knew that the longer... <clears throat> I sat in that space, the less likely I was to succeed. And so I knew I was going to get punched in the face and I know how to get out of it. I might be starting the game again, but I'm a seasoned athlete. I know the game, right? Let's get right back in. Let's go add value. Let's go find clients. Let's make new offers. Let's go do the game. And I would only lose when I allowed that zone of doubt to creep in and not allow me to take an action that would mitigate my pain. And so <clears throat> I launched the podcast. And then that was three years ago. We're 400 episodes in, and I rebuilt my whole career. Own six, seven new companies now. Uh, am coaching, you know, doing blank and, and blank, and I just wake up happy every day that I get to be in life with incredible human beings like you, man. Yeah, it's 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 incredible because I think you know there's so much to unpack there, and and again, there's concepts I, that I'm really excited. That's like to... the shortest version I've ever given, by the way. That was probably the best version I've ever. <laughs> <laughs> I've I've seen it before and and I think it's 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 awesome and and again going back to like concepts that I'm excited to talk about in terms of you know the movable middle and, and other things that we can help people with you know a lot of what you talked about reminds me especially in the beginning of the gap in the gain and so many people are living in the gap and and not acknowledging the gains that have had in life so you know it's it's wild the thing because I know that you went from you know, basically just putting out recipes on Facebook for free to then, you know, selling millions in, in ebooks and in physical yep. books and then reaching what most would think is the pinnacle of success. They've got the yep. materials, they've got the income, they've got the fame, they've got all these things yep. only to realize that you were completely unfulfilled and unfulfilled. got rid of all of it. So, everything. you know, I think that's a good place to start is, yeah. you know, where, where do you see most people going wrong when it comes to the perspective of the journey? Yeah, yeah, dude. Oh man. And I love, I love that you're asking me this because you get to be my example on modeling, uh, and answering this. So I think first thing is I'm blessed. I'm blessed that I learned a lesson multiple times that most people don't learn until they're 60 or 70 and it's too late. And that lesson is that I've been met with death closely one too many times, and it's reminded me of what truly matters. And what truly matters is not the cars, not the houses, not how many people show up for my funeral, it's how many people show up to support my family silently when I'm no longer here, right? Like, that's what matters. Like, that's what we really want, right? Like, I want you to know that if anything ever happened to you without question for the rest of her life, I would be by Noelia's side with anything she needed. Like, that's it. That's the only thing that matters to me in this world. And I think every human has an understanding of that and they know deep down in their core that that is true, but it gets cloudy in the world that we live in and it makes it really hard to play the game, especially when you're rewarded with dopamine and validation and more accolades, the more you get away from the fact of that one point that we're doing all of this for. And I think it's important to start there because if you ask most entrepreneurs why they wanted to become an entrepreneur, it's because, or self-employed or escalate themselves up the corporate ladder, they wanted to buy more time, money, or freedom, right? That's it. But to tell yourself that, and then use that time that you've already bought back to fill it with ear material things that don't allow you that freedom and don't allow you that space. That dissonance is what causes the game to be lost and frustrating from day one anytime you forget it. And I find 99% of the time where people are frustrated, it's because they lost focus on why they were doing it. So they were feeling out of alignment and it was causing massive pain everywhere. So I think that that is like, number one, the most important place to start. <clears throat> and then number two, you have to recognize what success is. And success is a byproduct of an equation. A purple Lamborghini is a byproduct of an equation. A $100,000 sale is a byproduct of an equation. You can't just go get me a purple Lamborghini. 
you would have to walk in, exchange cash, sign paperwork, and then get the car keys, right? <clears throat> you have to do one plus one to equal the thing. The reason people get frustrated and lose the game is because they want the thing and they never ask, what are the two things I have to add together to get the thing? And so they want the thing and then they throw spaghetti at the wall. So they get close to the thing and then they come back into the pool and they get really frustrated. And so you have to remember that success is just a byproduct, right? It is something that you equal up to. And the people that win in life, the world champions, the greats, they recognize that one plus one hacks to equal two. And so when you think about your business, even if you ever made your first 10 grand, you might be like, I don't know how I made that. But if we looked objectively, I would say you made 16 pieces of content, which led to 12 phone calls, which led to four sales calls, which led to three coaching clients. And it could be crystal clear on paper. But what ends up happening is that we get the win and then we celebrate the win thinking we've made it. And we never look at the behaviors that created the win in the first place. We throw the baby out with the bathwater and then we try to figure it out again, right? And so it starts by understanding what success is. So the reason that that's so important to understand is that entrepreneurship, business, anything that you think about is really just a matter of systems. Any business that you work in, you need to acquire attention or an audience then you need to convert that attention and then you need to fulfill on that attention. And so no matter what industry you're in, the business has been laid out on the core functions that would allow those things to happen. We lose when we think it's anything other than just a simple workout program. And so if we know that if you do these three things every day, it works, but you don't write it down of I'm going to do three by 10, five days a week, you literally get stronger and then stop flexing and working out the muscle that made you strong. And then you go to work out 30 days later and you're never as strong because you stopped the behavior. And so it's important to understand that success is simple and it's boring as shit because it's doing the things that you're committed to doing because they work irregardless of how you feel about doing them. And so as an example, Mike, I watch Mike do this left and right and it literally through osmosis motivates the shit out of me like i told him when we met i was like you will not get rid of me like you are my brother until you find a way to keep me away from you like i was like i'm in but mike will set a goal a purple lambo a boom 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 but the moment he sets that goal he doesn't think about it he doesn't obsess about it he gets to the math and he's like okay if that goal is six steps away what is the closest step and what are the three things that I can do to get to that step? And then you will watch Mike do this because he will then lock himself in his office and he will knock out those first three steps as fast as humanly possible because he knows that the moment those three steps are done, some are going to work and some are going to break. But what broke was the clarity he needed for the next three steps. And then he bites it down again. And if you watch him, if he sprints too fast, he'll buy himself some space. He'll take a trip with Noelia. He'll turn down his frequency and then he'll chunk it down again, consistently biting into different pieces. So if you were using working out as an analogy, it's like two days on chest, one day on legs, one day on back, and then matching how he feels. And so I think I overcomplicated the game so long because I thought that it was this illusional thing. Like I didn't know how. I was getting a million people a month on my website. Yes, I do. I posted a daily blog. I responded to every comment. I posted 24 times a day on Facebook because it was linear. And every time somebody commented or DM'd me, I would send them a link to the recipe. And I did that for 30 minutes a day. That's exactly how I got a million people a month on my website, right? But what we forget is that when we're in the game and we're on the field, we can't look at the tape of our performance and be able to analyze what works and what doesn't work. And what I found, Mike, at the core of it is because we allow our business and our performance in business to become our identity rather than our position that we're playing and learning how to play better. I love that. I think that's that's such a good reference point. And again, just like going back to the story of 
you know, that, that most people don't even know is, is looking at those goals. And, and I, I was, I fell victim to that same process of not falling in love with the process to the point where, you know, I, my whole goal is to get that car and to get this and to get that. And, and I had the millions, I had the cars, I had the penthouse and I was the most miserable that I was ever in my life. And yep. I was out of routine. I was sleeping in the afternoon, complete, yep. utter backwards behavior from what got me there. Um, because along that way, I ruined relationships. I was not spending time with my family and all these things that I was working toward that for me defined success, yep. I completely ignored and, and let go sideways out of the window. And yep. It, it was so unfulfilling and, and I was happier when I was in the trenches and yep. putting the work in consistently feeling that needle move. So, yep. you, you know, I think as you alluded to, it's, it's, it's important for people to understand like that concept of blissful dissatisfaction of being happy with where you are today, but also being unfulfilled, knowing that you've got yeah. so much more to prove and that I, dynamic. Yeah, I got two things to add and my brain's going to lose them. So I have to hit them both real quick because they're both relevant to what you said. So number one, Remember the thought of like, uh, if you gain weight and lose it, I'll remember that one in a minute. But the Mike Tyson quote that I love, and he was with Joe Rogan, and he said, discipline is doing the things that you hate to do, but doing them like you love doing them, right? That's the definition of discipline. And from somebody like Mike Tyson, I'm like, yes, like that's it, right? You take David Goggins, you take anything. It's not about the intensity though. It's about the consistency, right? Mm -hmm. And so that leads to the first part, right? Anybody that's listening to this, that's ever achieved something that's set out to achieve, running your first 5K, running your first Ironman, um, getting your first six pack, squatting your first 300 pounds, losing the weight, gaining the weight, right? Any one of those things, everyone listening to this has a memory of this that they can recall to where, and I'll use weight as an example, because I'm 170 pounds now. This is my healthy weight. At 39, I'm the healthiest I've ever been, but I've been as heavy as 275, right? And I've done that yo-yo from 165 to 275 two or three times and so have you right yeah. and you've you've had the same thing but don't you remember the moment you realized that you put the weight back on and then you started going back to the gym and you're like holy fuck if i had just simply went twice a week i would still be at that strength and i wouldn't have to do this again and all this time i could be using somewhere else because i would have just been maintaining right yeah. we have thousands of those reminders in our life and we recognize the importance of them and we realize that it's the consistency of those base behaviors that allow that success to happen well our business we for some reason treat differently but our business is no different and identical because what ends up happening and this happens until you learn the lesson and it's typically for most people it's the million dollar mark but for some people it happens around the six figure mark it depends on where they're coming from but right, that like that goal that they set, that six figures, that million dollars, right? Like that imaginary finish line is their life. It is everything. And so they hit it and then they hit it and they celebrate. But what they don't recognize is when they celebrate, they literally are like, oh, I finished the race. And so without realizing it over time, a few of the behaviors that they were doing consistently every day that created the momentum that they feel like they don't want to do anymore because they've made it are the things that prevent the more revenue or the next one coming in. And it's not that they don't want to do it anymore. It's that as an athlete, they got a little bit stronger and that programming is no longer effective, but you still have to train that same muscle. You just have to train it differently because you're at a different level. And so I say that because also understanding that scaling comes from subtraction and simplicity. It's not about adding 75 different variations of workouts. It's about keeping the same three and then changing how you do them, the depth at which you do them and the mastery of which you do them. Yeah, I, I love that, man. And, and I think, you know, that's a perfect segue into you know, some of the, the next things I'd love for us to dive into, which we, we have in the past, but, you know, concepts like movable middle floors and ceilings of saying, okay, you know, I, I see so many people in, in all aspects of business and they're just broken. They've got momentum in no areas of their yeah. life. They're yeah. looking at, okay, I'm here. I want to get to 100K or a million or whatever. And, and they can't even conceptualize 
yep. what can I even do today to get there? And they're focusing on the the entire race instead of winning the day. So, you know, I love for this. people, yeah, for people that are just broken down and out, building momentum in absolutely no way, shape or form, what is that next step? Yeah, I love this and I'm so glad. And I purposely answered those two things a minute ago, knowing we were going here because you've referenced the movable middle. And I think this is the perfect yeah. time. So I've taught this with you before, but I'm gonna teach it in its entirety now in a very simple way because there's, there's stages to this, right? So mm -hmm. um, let's look at anything that you consider in your life not broken. Let's just call it a trigger, right? A check engine light. I'm gonna use a trigger or check engine light, right? And so I imagine that me as an entrepreneur that I'm a vehicle, right? I got four tires and if I'm driving down the road and I get a flat tire and I don't have a spare, I'm gonna call AAA, right? That's the first thing I'm gonna do. I'm not gonna go get my knife and slash the other three tires. Or, like we agree, right? I shouldn't do that. Okay, cool. So now that we're all on the same page, that's what entrepreneurs do, right? Something breaks in the business, we get a flat tire, but because we don't have a plan or an integrous relationship with what's actually happening or our emotions are running us, we grab the biggest knife we can find and then we start slashing the other tires, right? And so the first step of anything is stop, stop, like pause. And here's an easy way. If you feel like you can't control your emotions, if you feel triggered, if you're having any emotion other than I'm so clear that this behavior is aligned to my future, irregardless of how I feel, there is one thing you do and you break check yourself as fast as humanly possible. That one thing alone is the secret between you being a failure and you being successful. That, that gap is called the wedge. So a book recommendation, Scott Carney, The Wedge. His first book, What Doesn't Kill Us, Makes Us Stronger, is about how he found the wedge through cold therapy. You can flex that wedge every single day and we will talk about it. But that I wanted to bring up because I have a model that helps me get through everything and I call it the AAA method on purpose. <laughs> Because anytime I'm triggered, I'm just like, call AAA. I just think everything flat tire because it's the first thing I'm going to do in my car. So the first A is awareness. The second A is acceptance. And the third A is action. Okay. The awareness is the most important part. If you get massively triggered and you start acting or reacting, you cannot have awareness because you are still on the field. So that pause is the most important place. And that doesn't mean the feeling's gonna go away. It doesn't mean you're gonna have clarity. It means you're going to break check and sit so that you can find it and not make it worse, right? Because the moment you get triggered and then you dive in, in that emotion, everybody listening knows exactly what I'm talking about. The feeling gets worse. The worst case scenario gets worse. The evidence gets worse. The pain in your body gets worse, right? Like we know it doesn't work. So stopping is the first part, okay? So awareness, okay? The second part is acceptance. So what I say is when you get triggered and you have that awareness, the first thing you need to do is get it out of your brain. This place, and I want everybody listening, watching this to understand, if there is any level of decision-making or anything happening in between your ears, it is a lose-lose game, guaranteed to fail because you literally have your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous competing with your consciousness, your trauma and triggers, tuning your reticular activating system, looking into more evidence to convince you to stay stuck. And then your logical and maybe part behavioral brain from personal development and this trying to pull you into something different. And it is just a massive cycle that your brain is trying to process and it can't. So the reason that most people lose is because when they get that awareness, they then just start to ruminate on it. So the first thing you need to do is get it out into the physical world. And there are one of a few ways to do this. Write it down on a piece of paper, a whiteboard, a sticky note, the wall, a mirror, I don't care. Speak it into an audio recording or record yourself on video. Call somebody, you just have to verbally get it out because once it comes out, it will allow your perspective to shift when you can see it or hear it, different than the emotion. What your body is looking for is a release valve that we do not have as human beings. We are one of the only mammals that does not have a natural built-in drainage system for our lymphatic system, right? So if you see an elk or a gazelle get away from a lion, 
the moment it's released, it shivers its body and then it just goes back to grazing grass. It releases the trauma. Human beings do have one, but it is a behavioral one, which is working out. The reason they say that human beings should move their body and sweat every day is because sweating is what drains your lymphatic system and helps your nervous system stay in check. The reason that people do rebounding, drain the lymphatic system, boom, boom, boom. Post-industrial revolution, when you have food at your disposal, water at your disposal, air conditioning, cars to drive everywhere, you're no longer forced to move. So now when people get stuck and they get triggered, they freeze, they open their phone, they go look at how great their life isn't on social media, they collect more evidence and they stop themselves from moving. That's exactly what happens, right? And environmental design is a big way to get out of this, but the first thing you need to do is get it out of your brain, right? So on paper, boom. When you have that, then you can go into acceptance because what you need is current state. And the big problem that most people have and the reason they can't get clarity, Mike, isn't because they don't know where they wanna go or how to get there, they're not integrously documenting where they currently are. They're mm -hmm. lying to themselves about the situation. And that goes back to the, what I opened this whole show with. That is the most important thing, because if you open Google Maps on your phone right now and put in a destination that you want to get to and then keep this current location blank and hit go, it cannot spit you out directions. And if you put the town in, that's three miles away or four miles away from where you are because you're not being descriptive, you're not going to know how to get from where you are to the town. And then if you just put the street, you're still going to have to walk out and guess where on that three mile street you're going to start and where that turn is. And so you would never try to navigate to a place that you actually want to go from a place that you don't know where you are without trying to figure out where you are number one survival technique in the world. I can't go anywhere until I can at least figure out where I am, where direction I'm pointing, boom. The acceptance part is the part where everybody needs to spend the most time. And that's not because you're bad and wrong. It's that things are not working. And the more aware you are of what isn't working, the more crystal clear you are on what you can fix. And so if you're a runner and your coach is watching you and they're like, hey, if you change this one thing in your stride, it'll decrease your mile by three seconds a mile. You would want him to tell you exactly what that thing is, not make you go guess or try to find it or, hey, guess, and then I'll let you know the next three times you race if it got better. But that's what most entrepreneurs do. That's what most human beings do, right? And the reason is because we don't practice being in a relationship with ourselves, being in our emotions, sitting with them irregardless of what's happening, right? It's all correlated to that same thing. So the acceptance piece is not that you're changing anything. It's that you're giving yourself an accurate triage diagnosis or looking at your check engine lights and being like, holy moly, there are a lot of them. And the reason that that has to happen is because that becomes your roadmap on how to mitigate them. Because when you can look at them, then you can prioritize them. And you might see seven of them, but realize there's one thing underneath all of them. And so then the most important thing is the action. And the action has to be an intentional action from your future, not a reaction from your past, which means the new behavior can't be, oh, I'm going to text my wife once a week because she's mad at me. Nope. The man that I want to be a year from now would send his wife a text three times a week that he's grateful for her. So that's my commitment for the next 30 days, right? It has to be something from the future, right? And so in that, that's the other place where people lose is they will do a current state analysis and then they will find every single symptom and then they will try to go treat all of them at the same time without doing any of the steps. And so then what you do is you look at them and you pick one to three that are the most important that have the biggest win. And this is where you have it stacked the right way. The one that's gonna have the biggest waterfall effect that you can do the easiest is the one I always pick with. And then this is where the model that we teach comes in. So the AAA method is how to be aware, right? So first you're aware, then you accept it. And in accepting it, you do your inventory, you prioritize what's there. And then the action is where the wedge of expectations comes in, which is the movable middle, right? So for all of you listening to this, one of the best books that you could ever read when it comes to customer journey, which also happens to be to change your own behaviors and become a catalyst for your own growth, is The Catalyst by Jonah Berger. 
if you read that book, it will help you understand what gets in your own way and also what gets in your customer's way. And then you take that and you stack it with Atomic Habits with this model I'm giving you. And the game basically gets really boring because you can just predict everything that's going to happen in your life because you can measure every single input. And so the wedge of expectations is simply this. When you realize that there's something that's important to you that's going to change your behaviors, that's going to have an impact, you have to commit to changing it and you have to protect the consistency over the intensity. And so by doing that, what you want to do is you want to set yourself up to win. And so I asked my clients two questions and I said, hey, on your dream day, in your ideal world, in this one area, and let's say their physical fitness is one of the areas that they're neglecting, on your dream day, how much time would you dedicate to this, right? And then I'll talk to them and they'll be like, an hour. I'm like, amazing, what would you do? And they'll give me some ideas. I'm like, great. So like on your dream day, we agreed that every day or at least five days a week, an hour of physical fitness in some way, they're like, yes, right? And then we do it for the next thing and it might be recording podcasts, right? And they're like, okay. My dream, I'm gonna do four a week. I'm like, amazing, right? And then the next one might be like writing, right? And they're like, I'm gonna write three emails a week, right? And I'm like, amazing. And they get pumped and they're like, oh, boom, boom, boom. But they forget that that's their dream day and the world's gonna punch them in the face because they're also in trauma right now. And so it's not like you have eight hours of your day open. You probably have 30 minutes that you can buy back from bad behaviors to start using. And so that's why most people lose is they commit to being a world champion without realizing that they're at the starting line. And you might have the mindset, you might have the skill set, but you're in a different game and you might pick it up faster, but you still have to start at step one. And so then the inverse, I ask people on your absolute worst day, what's the minimum that you can commit to? Okay. So on your best day, we call that the ceiling. On your worst day, we call that the floor. And I'm honest about this. I don't sugarcoat this. I have witnessed a lot of death in my life. I have attempted my own life. I've been in and out of the hospital for this. It is something that is very, very real to me. And the level of integrity I have with this is only for me, but you can build your own relationship with it. But I made a commitment to myself that I wasn't going to take my life. And in that, the full integrity of that is also recognizing that any moment I exist on this planet and I'm allowing my emotions to cloud my actions of being present and living, I am choosing a slow death and I am not okay with that. And so when I ask this question, I say on your worst day, like the worst day that you could ever imagine to where you would have a sliver left of I wanna live, but you made the decision to live knowing that what you did in that moment was gonna matter. In your physical fitness, what's the bare minimum that you could commit to? And they're like, oh shit. And I'm like, yeah, that one. And they're like 10 minutes outside, like amazing. And I was like, what about the podcast? Like knowing millions of people's lives depend on it and you still have a job and your lighthouse is still on. And they're like, I could write out like three ideas. I'm like, great, right? And so we go through and we make a floor for every single behavior. And then we take those and then we make a commitment to protect the consistency over the intensity. And the goal is to hit the floor every single day and i use pareto's principle across the board so if i have three of them i have to hit the floor of at least two of them every day right now i never do that i go all in and i set my floors to where basically i can't come up with one reason or justification as to how i could not manage to do it every day right like and i can do all of mine in like 15 minutes right and their habits stacked on top of each other and so i think that that's the most important way to think about and describe this. And I also want to to say a few things about this. If you're familiar with neuro-linguistic programming, NLP, they teach this model called the logical levels of the brain, right? And you basically exist on like a thinking level, a being level, a consciousness level, a paradigm level, right? There's levels. A lot of human beings get stuck because you can't change anything permanently when you're on the level that you're on. So if you have an issue with your thinking, and you have negative thinking every single day, no matter what, no matter what behaviors you do or actions you do to try to change that in your thinking will not happen. But if I go above your thinking to your environment and I come into your office where you spend 20, you know, 20 hours a day and I put happy quotes and family photos on the wall and do the environment, that environment will force a thought change. Or I could go to your behaviors below it and institute a 10 minute breath work or a 15 minute walk outside every day 
that would allow you to see something that you're grateful for, which would then naturally change your thinking, right? And so when I come to entrepreneurs, I think what's so important about space and stillness, which is Mike knows, this is probably the thing that I'm more bullish on than anything. In that space, it allows you to filter through all the noise and all the wrapping paper of like what all the thoughts and the things are to find the easiest thing at the core level that when you change it consistently will waterfall to everything else above and below it, right? And so for Mike and I, I know this. You want an easy tell to if Mike and I are not doing good, look at our physical health. Our physical health is a direct representation for how we feel on the inside. No joke. I know that to be true all day and every day. And so I know that. And so for me, if I'm looking at everything in my life that's broken, how I don't have clients coming in, how I just lost a million dollar deal. And I'm like, oh my God, I have 31 days of operating capital. And I know that I haven't been working out every day. I don't need to ask any other question. I don't need to have another thought because I know that the moment I get in that gym consistently, I'm going to start having clarity and process my emotions and get right back on to a race that I've already run before. I just forgot about it. And that's what I need. I need the reminders to get back to what I know because that base behavior is going to positively impact everything. But the level of awareness that you have to have to win this is I'm an athlete. Like I am a world athlete at what I do. And that doesn't mean that I'm going to win every game and that every play is going to be perfect. And I'm going to, I mean, I fucking took some massive strikeouts last week and oh man, like my, my ego still hurts a little bit. My heart still hurts a little bit. Right. But then to be like, oh my God, I'm never coaching again. I'm never giving another keynote it would be the silliest thing ever. Or to pretend that it was great would be even more dumb because then I'm going to do it again. And I'm like, oh no. Okay. What could I have done? Oh, there's a good tilt. Oh, I could have said it that way. Oh, that would have landed better. And I wrote them all down. And then I coached them that way a couple days later. And I was like, oh my God, that feels so better, so much better. And so that's the way that you, you kind of get into it. But I think it's important because it really comes down to that integrity with that relationship. And so the reason I go back to stillness. I had a monk on my podcast and he was a client of mine. He was in my mastermind. He was a, a monk at a Tibetan monastery for like seven years. And he did like a couple of them in silence. And I loved him because he cusses and he drops F-bombs and it just makes my heart happy. And I had him on the podcast and this was the most viral clip of the show. I basically asked him something and it triggered him. And he's like, you want to know how I can tell if people are living or not? He's like, if you can't take a shit without your phone, you're not alive. And it, it challenged people like to the core to think about that we literally live in a time where we can't even be alone with our thoughts in the bathroom without our phone in our hand. That is the number one secret to having a bulletproof mindset, a bulletproof ability to navigate, an ability to grow is your ability to be with yourself. Because at the end of the day, all the distractions that get in the way of your success are the things that you're going to, to avoid the feeling that you're having. And no matter what you end up at that feeling, except you end up there the painful way or the proactive way. And the proactive way is a lot more beneficial and a lot more fast to get to where you want to go. But it requires that you have an ability to sit with it. And yeah, I still have the thoughts of like, oh, I'm a bad dude or, oh, I'm a bad you know, husband or I'm a bad father. Or, I failed today. It's not that you don't have them. It's that when they come, you recognize what they are and you sit with them to let all the noise pass. So what I look at my brain is like, it's a snow globe, right? And if I'm having horrible thoughts, I'm like, dude, something snook my show globe today. Like it is shook hard, right? And I'm like, cool, this is a fun ride. And I'm like, I shouldn't touch anything in the business right now. So then the other model that I know you love is the SOS model, which leads directly into this, which is, the moment I have that awareness, right? I call AAA and I'm like, oh shit, I'm in drama, right? I'm like, okay, cool. I recognize that. I'm like, oh, I got to be with this. And I start to look at it. I'm like, oh, this is interesting. Okay. And if I can't find any clarity, I don't want to sit with it forever. So I kind of made a model so I can. And so when it happens, I set a 15 minute timer <laughs> and I give myself 15 minutes to let the snow globe settle because I know in that 15 minutes, I'm not getting on a sales call. I'm not recording a podcast, right? If I'm aware of this, it's getting in the way of everything I'm doing. And so my SOS model is a concentric bullseye, right? There's an inner circle, which we call inner tools, right? And then the next ring is called the inner circle. And then the outer ring is called the outer circle. 
The inner tools is the most important one. This is anything that you have access to that you can do in under a minute or five minutes that basically resets your nervous system or reminds you of who you are and helps you process emotions, right? So dancing, singing, music, breath work, working out, walking outside. Um, some people, um, oh, cold therapy, uh, screaming, um, you know, breath work, yoga, like anything that you do that you've ever gone to in your life when you felt the worst and you're like, oh yeah, I just want to do that one thing, right? Like mine, number one is barefoot outside instantaneously, irregardless of the weather. It's it's about instant, especially January in Montana when it's negative 41. Um, no matter how bad my day is, the moment I walk out that door, I am grounded in about two seconds. And then I'm like, okay, cool, get back inside, go figure it out, right? So I set that 15 minute timer. And in that inner tools, what I do is I list out in order of priority, what's the most effective for me. Right. So like that's number one. Number two is a playlist that I've made called Mindset Change. And it's my favorite songs that change my mindset. That's number two. Breath work is number three. And so I'll put that music on while I'm outside and doing breath work. And typically I'd say 95% of the time I can get through it or I'm watching it and all the dust settles and I'm like, oh, I can see what happened. I need to fix that. I need to fix that. I need to fix that. Right. So then I make that list. And then I prioritize it in, right? If my SOS, my inner tools can't get me through and that 15 minute timer goes off, well, then I call the inner circle. And so the inner circle are nine people in my life that hold me accountable to my potential without believing my story. So that means they know my goals, they know what I'm up to. And on my iPhone, my casino, this, they are the top nine in order of priority and who I call in what order. So if I get through that 15 minutes, I text them or call them like, hey, uh, inner circle time. Uh, I just sat with this. This is what I'm feeling. This is the challenge. And then typically there's one, two questions. And then they're like, oh, have you thought about this? If I'm like, oh shit. Right. And then I have clarity. And then most of the time they either give it to me or they're like, Hey, did you call the attorney? Hey, did you call your tax guy? Hey, did you call Ashley? And so I'm like, oh no. So the outer circle are resources or things in your life that come up. And then when a new one comes up, you add it into the outer circle. And so on my phone for environmental design, if you open my iPhone notes, the number one pinned note says SOS. And when you open it, it says inner tools in order, one, two, three, four, five, 15 minute timer. Number two, inner circle in order, go to iMessages. Number three, outer circle by name, lawyer, this one, boom, this one website, this one. So I never have to think when I'm triggered. And so then if I'm in my day and in my life and something gets in the way and I even forgot that I committed to that wedge of expectations and that behavior, then immediately I hit my SOS and the whole point of my SOS is to get me back home. And so the whole reason I do it is if I'm doing my inner tools and I come back home, I'm like, oh, I haven't done my wedge of expectations today. That's why I feel like shit. Or my inner circle knows, hey, I know you're triggered right now. Have you done your sacred light keeper quadrants today? I'm like, no. And they're like, go do them. And if you still don't have clarity, call us back, right? And so it's always basically, how do I remember that I'm a professional athlete and everybody just said I lost the race and I'm a failure, but I know I'm not. What is the workout I'm supposed to be doing right now? And that's all that we want to get back to. And so when I teach customer journey, Mike, they've all heard this. When I teach the zone of doubt, the zone of doubt came from me fixing my behaviors and then realizing that everybody who buys goes through that same zone. And so success as a human isn't about getting out of the batter's box and then analyzing your swings and waiting for the next game. It's literally staying in the batter's box, making the first adjustment and then swinging again and swinging again and swinging again and swinging again. And so the longer the gaps exist where we're ruminating, where we're not doing any of those behaviors, that's stagnation. And typically when we're in that, it's because we're looking for a behavior we're not gonna find. So we end up picking up an old one anyways, and then we dig ourselves back in. And so that gap is so, so, so important, right? And that gap I call the zone of doubt, that gap is also controllable through the wedge by Scott Carney's book, right? And your ability with a stillness practice or to sit with that. And, and all I mean by that, just to give a tangible example, is like you might be driving in a car and you might get a text message saying, I just lost my number one client and literally get nauseous and literally be like, holy fuck. And in that moment, you have a default behavior, which is typically probably pick up somebody and call them. 
oh my God, what am I going to do? Right? Everybody knows what I'm talking about. All I'm talking about is in that moment, not picking up the phone, but acknowledging that you feel like shit and that you normally want to pick up the phone. And so for the next one minute, you're going to set a timer just to not call and see if you can sit with this before you call and get any level of clarity. That's it. That is all I'm talking about. And if you do that once a day for the next 30 days, you'll end up doing it 75 times an hour without even realizing it, right? That's all I'm talking about. That closes that zone with a new behavior that's very, very chunkable. So in the movable middle, in the thing that Mike is referencing to save you, but the chapter is on distance. Every human should read this chapter. But Jonah talks about the concept of the movable middle. And we forget that when we're in trauma or we're in pain, we can't see as far out than when we are in pleasure, right? So if Mike and I are having a happy day, we close a million dollar deal and we're like, let's plan our future. Our future's gonna look beautiful, beautiful. If you call me after I lose a million dollar client and I'm down to my 21 days of cash flow and you ask me to build my future, it's not gonna look so beautiful, right? Like it's not even fucking close. <laughs> and it's, it's important to understand that. And so when you get triggered, you might have that big vision, but because you're triggered, you can't see that far anymore because your lens is only tuned in to the pain directly in front of you. So the concept of the movable middle is that understanding that for you and your clients is that yes, when everybody's happy and they're committing to working with you, of course they're gonna want that. But the moment the first struggle happens in their life or in their business, they're only gonna be able to see five feet in front of their face and they're not going to remember any of that positive stuff exists. And if they can only see five front in front of their face, guess where all their other clarity is? Exactly where they used to be and in their past and all the evidence. See, this doesn't work. See, it's not boom. See, I can't change it. And we have the same thing happen to us as humans. And so to combat this, the reason that happens is because when we get triggered, that gap feels so insurmountable, we can't take a bite because we literally don't know where to stick the fork. So the reason the floor is so powerful is because it creates your movable middle. Because in that moment, you're like, there's no way I can go to the gym for an hour. But there's no reason you can't go for a five minute walk outside. And so by doing that, it closes the zone of doubt by instituting your own movable middle without having to think about what it is. And the moment you get into the behavior, what's going to happen is you're going to start opening up your reticular activating system a little bit to the 10 and the 15 and the 20 that you couldn't see before. And so that's why this works so good. And it's really about holding yourself accountable, knowing that you have the fishing pole and this level of integrity that I talk about, Mike, it's really, really important to understand that if I'm sitting here and I've made a commitment to my wedge of expectations and I said, this is what I committed to and I don't want to do it. My level of integrity in that moment is not shaming myself, but then being honest of like, okay, well, why don't I want to do this? Because I said I wanted this, right? It's not about having this rigid relationship with the behaviors or the thing. It's about having a rigid relationship with your integrity with them and why you're doing that. And most of the time, if I'm like, well, I don't fucking do it today, right? Like it was yesterday. I'll be really, really honest. Yesterday I was, I was in a rough place when it came to my commitments and I know myself and I had every goal of hiking to the top of the mountain. And I know there's a mile of snow to get through, which is fucking hard. And I was like, all right. And then I was like, you know what? No, I couldn't get to the trailhead. And I was like, all right, here's the deal. I'm here. I'm on the mountain. I'm just going to hike up a mile and then I'll hike down a mile and I'll do repeats until I'm full. And I was like, all right, cool. Because like no part of me wanted to go to the top, none. And I was like, nope, nope, nope. I was looking at my watch. I was like, I don't have time. I need to be home for the kids, you know, boom, boom, boom. So I knew myself. So I was like, totally fine. So I just picked a mark that I was like, all right, no matter what, I can get to that mark. That mark was a half a mile up the hill. Well, uh, I hit that mark and then I was like, there can't be too much more snow. And I was like, all right, fine. I'll go to 0.75. And I was like, fine. And then I get to 0.75 and I was like, it is thinning out. And I was like, the trailhead's up there. Screw it. I'll just go to a mile and see what happens. And I hit the mile and I was like, there's no more snow. And I looked at my clock and I was like, there's two miles to the summit. If I run, I can make it in 40 minutes. And if I run down, I can make it to my car in the same amount of time to get the kids. And I was like, fuck it, go. 
And sure as shit, I ran to the top of that mountain yesterday, made it to the top, took a video for evidence, and then sprinted down and made it to my car 10 minutes before I planned. But if I didn't drive to that trailhead and just commit to that first 0.5, I would have gotten my car, driven home, ruminated for 40 minutes about how upset I was that I should have gone, felt guilty, almost probably went to the gym, right? This, the whole spiral just would have continued. And instead I got home, realized my son wasn't even there because he was out with my in-laws. Everybody asked about the hike and they're like, did you make it to the top? We wondered if we could go, what's it look like? And I had videos and pictures to show them. <laughs> and I was like, I can't imagine coming home like, oh, what'd you do? Oh, I was going to go for a hike, but I felt like shit and realized that I needed to be home for my son. And they're like, he's out till nine. Why didn't you go? We would have told you, right? You know what I mean? And so like, I, I, I had it happen yesterday. Yeah, it's, I, I love that, man. There's so many things to unpack here. And, and I just kind of want to give like my own experience as well, you know, based on, on, you know, the real estate industry and also my lifestyle where, you know, talking about the movable middle, we see this all the time with agents that have, you know, it's, it's a typical quote, you never rise to the vision, you fall to your standards, right? And you never achieve your goals, you achieve your standards. And there's so many people that say, well, you know what? I want to do 24 deals this year. Well, you've never even developed the discipline and the behaviors to do one. Let's start with one, because if you can do one, you can do two. And if you could do two, you can do four. But so many people are trying to take that big bite sized chunk. And, you know, it's almost like that viral post that you see on social media sometimes where, you know, you, you say, okay, I want to make a million dollars. And to most people, a million dollars is such a an astronomical feat that you can't even conceptualize doing that. But then you'll see it's X amount per quarter, X amount yep. per month, X amount per week. And you're like, oh, it's only $3,333 a day. Well, yeah. that seems reasonable. Like, I think I could do that. If I've got a $1,000 program, I can sell three. And now it's like, okay, yep. let's get there. And mm -hmm. it's that concept of of that movable middle. and and. You know, I think the the other thing I just want to toss in there is is that wedge of expectations and how important this is because as you alluded to with our health being a direct reflection of our business, it, it entirely is with me. And what I found is, you know, one of two situations where either, you know, business would not be going as well. So instead of falling to a floor, I would fall to ground zero. And yep. it was, it, you know, entrepreneurs oftentimes operate in extremities. It's either I'm all in or I'm all out. And mm -hmm. that's what starts to break momentum. And I even found this every time I traveled where it was like, okay, I'm, I'm getting in great shape for this trip. And then I would go on the trip, throw everything out the window, come back, break momentum, go back to ground zero. And now I have to go repeat and do it all again. And I think it's really important for people to be able to, you know, identify that floor because oftentimes what you'll find is like, you know, you, you, you want to do, you know, video, for example, and the alternative for most people is I'm either going to do eight videos a month or I break my habit and I'm doing none. But if you just did two, if you just did four and kept in that consistent momentum, that will allow you to get back on track. So I think that's just what I really wanted to kind of pull together there. But the last thing I just wanted to kind of I was over here typing into. notes of what you said because I was like, no, no, yeah. Mike, he just made this point, this point, this point, and like we can tie it together in a minute. That's what I was writing down because yeah. the one thing I want to add before you tie it, and you nailed this, but um, I have not introduced you to this man yet, but you will meet this man in person, Jeff Spencer. Um, Jeff, for context, uh, he's the gold medal he's the gold medal people coach, right? So he coaches Lance Armstrong, Tiger Woods. He's responsible for 77 gold medals. He's an Olympian himself. The guy is just, he's Mr. Miyagi, right? And he's been one of my teachers and also one of my students. Uh, it's a beautiful relationship, but one of the most important things he taught me, um, he taught me what makes people great. And he has this champion's blueprint on every single athlete he ever put through it. And he's like, the only reason we won every single time is because we understood temperance. And temperance is where champions live because we go for 70% every day, knowing that three to four times a month, it's going to demand a hundred percent sprint that will drop us down to 40 and a day or two later, we'll get right back to 70. And then that's where the Olympics come in. And that's where the things come in. And he's like, that's what wins the game. And you talk about this with entrepreneurship. I think what's really, really important is that there are two parts of entrepreneurship. There is entrepreneurship that exists as a function and a service and a tool to give you everything that you want in your life. And there's entrepreneurship that serves as an addiction 
that convinces you it's that thing and stops you from having everything you want in your life. And one of the easiest tells is if you're operating in extremity, you're looking your business, it's an addiction and not a tool. It's the easiest tell because you recognize it's a tool when you see that it's a series of programs that you put into place to achieve whatever your current goal is. And, and Mike, I just wanna give credit to what you're saying because every time that I lost, it was because I took an action in a swing. And anytime I won, it was because I went all the way out to the swing and just allowed it to come a little bit back in and then took action. And every single time, if you can just hold past those extremes and use these things, it makes a massive, massive difference because everybody literally, they have this goal of like, I want to build this vision in a decade, but they measure it in days and they make yeah. decisions based on the day and they prevent the decade from being done. I love that. It's, it's again, it's, you know, the concept that we always talk about, which is, you know, the ones that can extend the time horizon for the furthest are the ones that are going to win. Because I see this all the time in video. It's like, you know, uh, you know, it, people will say real estate, they want to get on YouTube. And it's like, okay, the question they ask themselves is, you know, how long is it going to take a client uh, to get a client or will I get one in three months? And, you know, they're, they're setting themselves up for immediate disappointment because the question I always ask them is, you're going to get disappointed if you don't hit it in three months. But what if your expectation was, I want to get clients in 10 years. If you don't get it in three months, it's not going to phase you. My and favorite when you Elon can... Musk quote. My favorite yeah. Elon Musk quote. The, the, he's like, someone's like, why would you try to go to Mars in a year? And he's like, because I'm guaranteed to make it further than the guy who set the goal for 10. Right. Yeah. And that's the thing with the relationship. Right. Like they're like, well, how quick am I going to get my client? That's what I said earlier. That's thinking that you can solve a math equation by just saying, give me the answer, right? That's yeah. that whole thing. Because the moment that you ask that and it's changing your behaviors, you're already stopping yourself from doing the things that would even allow yourself to get a client. So you can't win that game because you'd have to create consistent videos that added some level of value or solved the problem and then found eyeballs to then watch those videos. And if you did one, plus one, you're guaranteed to get two, except what it would look like is you might do 17 videos to get six comments. And then you might message each person you comment and build a relationship with two of them and then offer something to two of them and have them both tell you no. And your success comes down to your ability to take that no and not react and be like, okay, well, what would make it better or what would you need or what can I do better? And then taking that answer making that adjustment and then finding six more for two more. And then maybe one of them says yes. And then the other one who says no, asking them again, why you sucked. And then asking the one that won what they liked and then what you could do better and then go do it again. Yeah. But I guarantee you that without those videos going up consistently, you wouldn't have the menu or the chair to serve it to somebody to see if they like it or if you should take it on or off the menu. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love that. And and I think, you know, to pull this full circle and, and kind of close the loop that was open in the beginning, the, the loop in my mind that was open in the beginning was you identified and specifically stated that you, you achieved, you know, so much in your life and what you wished 20 years ago is that somebody helped you better understand how to appreciate where you are in the journey as time goes on. There's yeah. so many people that are going to relate to that where they're stuck, they feel broken, they feel down and out, but they're, they have no tools, no way to identify and appreciate where they are within their journey. What is your best piece of advice for people to contextualize this entire concept of where they are today, knowing how that fits into where they want to go? Yeah, I'll give you though, I'll give you the fastest path to get the truth and have it land right now. For everybody listening to this, this is what you do. If anything that Mike said to you is true, hey, I'm not seeing myself. I've made no progress. I'm such a failure. I want you to think right now about those three people in your life that are there right now. Like, even though you think like that right now, that texted you this morning and said, have a great day, or I love you, or I'm so proud of you, or hey, thinking about you. And every single one of you has one in the last week. And then I want you to call them or talk to them in person or get on video or FaceTime face to face. And I want them to tell you I want you to tell them integrously how you feel. I feel like I'm a failure. I feel like this isn't work and I'm stuck. And then I want you to ask them how they see you. And there's one condition. You can't respond. You just have to listen 
until they're complete. And I highly recommend you record this. That is the fastest path because you will never allow yourself to see who you are. But in order for other people to see you, you have to be open and honest with them. I'm saying that to you because there is no other way that will work like that. Mm -hmm. That is the best way. Now, if you're like, screw that, great. I'll suck the oxygen out of that excuse. Great. That would be if you are a woman, read the book, Do the Work by Nicole LaPera. And that means do the work. I will say this. If you ask me for a path to a million dollars and I said, do these three things every day for 90 days and you didn't do them, I am not the reason you do not have a million dollars. If I recommend this book and you think it's fun to toe tap and you don't do it, I am not the reason. And if you ever reach out to me and say, yeah, I read the book and it didn't work, I'm going to know exactly what happened. And I'm going to tell you to go pound sand until you finish the book. Do the work by Nicole LaPera for men personality isn't permanent by Benjamin Hardy. And that's just a default for me. I've read both. I prefer personality isn't permanent now, but I have a lot of men that also like to do the work. One takes the feminine approach and one takes the masculine approach to the same thing. And it's about future self journaling and behavioral design, which puts you in the lens of perspective of a self audit and an awareness step. Um, and so those are the best places that I can recommend to start. And then here's what I want to tell everybody. You win the game when you're accurately aware of where your situation is without making it bad and wrong. And so if that means that you're sitting here and you're like, no, I feel like such a failure. If you just make it okay that you feel like a failure, that is actually the first step over and over and over again, because here's the thing, it is okay. Because this morning I felt like that for about an hour on my drive in as I was asking myself where it was coming from and where I felt out of alignment, right? Just because I feel something doesn't mean the narrative that my brain is making up about the feeling is real. It's just a story that's triggered by episodic memories of the 85 billion things my reticular activating system takes in every day and then the couple million it chooses to remember and then the ones it forgets about when I sleep, right? Like it's, it's just this thing. And our brains are not there to give us an accurate, integrous thing or reading of what's there it's to give us some information for us to ask and i tell everybody this and and this is the one question i ask myself mike and this is this is really really it i want everybody to ask yourself this question right now about whatever story you're making up that you're a failure that you're boom and i want you to really really think about this question and i want you to think about that story and ask yourself that story that you're telling yourself right now do you believe it's so true that in this moment, if I assembled a jury of our peers, of 12 people, that you would put yourself on a life or death sentence to prove to that jury that that story is true. If you do not believe that, you are already through 90% of the hard shit. And I'm telling you this because you're gonna convince yourself that you're not, but you know, based on that one question, that I doubt any of you would be willing to take that bet, which means the only challenge is you're believing your own bullshit. And the moment you can eradicate it and you're like, wow, I really don't believe that. Yeah, no, 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 I'm really not that bad. No, nope. And here's what I do. I go put on like below deck Mediterranean for about 10 minutes and then I feel incredibly better about myself and realize like I'm not running, you know, boat charters, yacht charters and I don't yeah. deal with any of that drama. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to go record a podcast now because like that, that's way better, right? Like yeah. it really, really, what we need to practice is we need to practice holding ourselves accountable. And I think at the end of the day, Mike, I think you realize this and it took me a long time to realize this, that the moment we gave up having somebody tell us what to do in exchange for money. We also gave up having somebody tell us what to do when we felt like crap or felt good or whatever. And we all did that recognizing that this truly is a game of one. Now, you will never be successful alone. It will always be a community and a tribe, but your success comes down to that tribe seeing you and holding you accountable to doing the work that you committed to doing. And when you start to understand that and really dive into that relationship and realize that every single behavior and action that you take every day either has a direct subtraction or addition to where you want to go you start thinking like this very quickly and very excitedly 
because I know that if I'm emotional and I'm believing that story for six hours on a Friday, that's six podcasts that are not going out into the world that have massive impact attached to them. And now that I have that relationship, it, it does, it does have pressure. It does have feelings attached to it as it should, as it should. And just like anything in life, you get better at being an athlete and you get better at being at the top and on the podium. You don't get to work less to stay there. You have to work harder to gain less, to get mm -hmm. higher. That's how this game goes. And that's what it looks like. And so know that you're never going to make it never because it's the journey. And the moment you love it, you will always win because that's the beautiful thing. Like you could take everything away tomorrow. I'd find a new platform, a new medium and a new message. And I'm going to end up doing the same thing, right? Like it's yeah. just a matter of default at this point. And, um, I think another thing I'm doing a podcast breakdown right now on the talent code by Daniel Coyle. And I think as well in relevance, Mike, what a good undertow for all of this is, is, is also really, really in this looking at like who you are and what lights you the fuck up. Like, what are you so good at? What do you love doing? Like, what is it there? And I'm doing this entire like eight series breakdown, but the book is incredible about like deep practice and curiosity and uh, attempting things out of your comfort zone, which gets you more into these behaviors that allow you to find these pockets. And so that's another recommendation for everybody would be um, the talent code by Daniel Coyle. Incredible, man. And and I think, you know, it's such a great way to kind of summarize everything is, is a quote that where you are is not who you are. And so many people are letting where they oh, are right now, you. completely define themselves. And exactly, you know, the all too many people need to be more mindful of the words they say to themselves because the words you say to yourselves become your reality, knowing that perception is reality. And I think it's really important to audit the words that you're saying, audit the things you tell yourself, audit when you say, I am this, are you really, or is that on a continuum scale that you can better reference as to, you know, what's actually going on in your life. So dude, I know we could go on for hours and hours and hours, but you know, I think that's the entire reason that your podcast exists. So, yeah, you know, why yeah. don't you tell people, you know, where, where do they find out more about you? Yeah. What can they do to, to follow along? And, and I know you've got basically the blueprint uh, mapped out on some of your platforms. I do. And we're actually turning this behind the scenes now the whole wedge and sos into like a 30-day accountability program so we're working on that right now and one thing that you just said mike because we could talk for hours but you just gave everybody a really simple tool and i'm gonna bring it up to the surface right now so understand that what we've talked about today is a muscle look at it as your mind muscle but it's hard to see it right because you can't physically see it but trust me it's a muscle right it's just a mind muscle that you're going to work out You'll notice earlier when I shared my story, I said I struggled with bulimia. I struggled with PTSD. I struggled with addiction. You did not once hear me say, I am bulimic. I am an addict. I am boom. I am not those things. Those were things that I did. Those were behaviors that I took out of trauma or out of misalignment. And so what Mike is talking about is in the book, The Talent Code, he talks about deep practice. And we, we look at these people we emulate, right? Like the Casey Neistat's, which we were talking about earlier. And everyone wants to know how he does what he does. And he's like, I've out edited everybody by 100,000 times, right? Like people do 10,000 hours. He's like, I did 150,000 hours before I even posted a video, right? And people like me with customer journey, like, how am I ever going to know it like you? And I was like, well, I've been teaching it every day for 20 years. I don't know. That's why I don't write anything down, right? And I think that we forget that the more we practice something positively, the more we master it and don't even realize we've mastered it. And what you just said about the I am statement is one of the easiest ways. And so even in personal development, when we're coaching people in the room and Mike watches me do this in events and even with him, if they're speaking and they're like, they'll say something negative, I will be like, really? Is there another way to say it? And then they'll reframe it instantly. And so for me in the beginning, I had sticky notes all over my desk. And every time I would have a negative thought, I would write it on a piece of paper and if I didn't have a positive thought to replace it, then I would either crumple it up and throw it in the trash or I would put them in a pile and I would burn them at the end of the day. And that's how I started. And then I got to the point where I would write one down and then I would cross it off and then I would rewrite the new belief in an empowering one. And then I started doing it in my keynotes and there's keynotes of me doing this where I would be on stage and I would say something self-deprecating and I'd be like, wait, hold on, cancel, cancel, cancel. 
And then I would say the new statement and everybody would laugh and then I would explain what I was doing. And so the more you flex these muscles, the better. And so when Mike is saying, use this to your disposal, this is one of the easiest ways to do it. When you catch the thinking, reframe the thinking because that's realigning your programming to how you view the world. And so the reason people struggle is because they're like, well, I don't know how to change it. This is exactly how to change it, but there's no easy button. It's at every single time you're doing a squat. It comes up squat, 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 squat. You might do 780 hair squats that day, but I promise you in a year, your legs are gonna be so fucking strong that you could just sit in a squat all day. And so I wanted to give credence to that. So with that, one of the things that's important to me on my podcast is that every single thing that you listen to is something that you can take and put into practice immediately. I want it to be uh, chronological from the beginning to the end or an encyclopedia of you of tools to reference. And we do that very, very intentionally. I try very hard to make everything digestible and easy. And so it's called the Mind of George Show. Everywhere that podcasts are found, mindofgeorge.com. Um, the most beautiful pink website ever. But I'm going to say this, and I'll, I'll be very blunt about this. If you're a human, my podcast is for you. I promise. Even if I'm speaking through the lens of business or entrepreneurship or marketing, it's all foundational principles based on human behavior and success. And you can take anything. And one of the things that I love about Mike is his repeatables that I take. And, and one big thing that he's so big on is getting the next one thing for that next one bite. And so treat this episode the same, treat the podcast the same, but make sure you keep it in your ecosystem because it's only there right now because you remember it, but keep it as a part of it. So when you're getting triggered or you need a reminder, that's where you go instead of the same places. So make sure you subscribe, check out a couple episodes. They're all there. Mindset, business, marketing, customer journey, wedge, SOS. I mean, everything is there for free, taught in its entirety and anything we can do to help, um, let us know. But yeah, that's the whole spiel. Love it, dude. Well, again, thank you so much, George. It's it's a blessing and an honor to be on this journey with you and, and you know, for you to be able to pour into the community like this. And again, guys, I'm going to make sure to link all of George's incredible stuff below. It genuinely will change your life. And again, it's important to make sure that you give it undivided attention, follow it, but also implement it and put it into practice um, so that you can start to see the gains in all aspects of your life. So thank you again, brother. I appreciate you. Brother, honor, man. Thank you.